Next week on Thursday, Chapter 4 Running Shoes and Car Keys I taunted Harold about being a typical man. So your wife takes care of your missus for you? Oh, you are such a woman, he countered. I knew something was wrong. You were so aloof, distant. But of course you had to be a coquette and refused to tell. And how would you have dealt with me crying all over you? You'd have sent for Gloria with her mop and smelling salts, I suppose. I found a spot for your picture. You can put it in the garbage or the shredder for all I care. It doesn't matter anymore. My words were devoid of malice. His voice was warm with affection. You are so perfect, aren't you? The thank you would never happen. The omission ceased to erode my peace of mind. Things were back to normal. My lip reading skills improved rapidly. I arranged to meet Harold at his home at eight o'clock on a Tuesday morning in August, almost three and a half years since my ordeal began. He would drive me downtown to the federal court to attend pre-trial on my case. Harold was watching for me through the window. The ornate front door opened. He stood at the threshold as I pulled up and got out. Eyes sparkling when he saw what I held in my hands. He called out for Gloria to come and get the bowl of mango mousse I carried. Gloria appeared in a sports bra and spandex shorts, hot and damp from exercise. She wished us luck and reached for the glass bowl. I sensed from the tone and expression her apprehension about the day ahead. It felt like a foolhardy field trip. It was a long time since I'd seen Harold in formal attire. He looked frail in the lightweight grey suit with a yellow and brown splashed tie knotted at his throat. Gloria would have had to help him with the shirt buttons and the tie and with the laces on the brown running shoes he wore. The latter struck a discordant note in the ensemble, an odd fashion faux pas. Harold carried a legal file and his amplifier in a bag slung over his shoulder. You look 18 years old, he said. What size do you take? A zero? My lips parted in a tense smile. The twins had recently turned 12. We were silent for most of the drive downtown. Let's Go somewhere afterwards, he mouthed. Where? To the circus? He smiled and didn't answer. Spoken words were a drain on his stamina. He used them sparingly. The traffic was heavy and I was thankful for the early start. I was taken aback to realise that I wasn't nervous about Harold being at the wheel. He made deft lane changes and drove at times with a single hand on the steering wheel. He took his eyes off the road from time to time and squeezed my hand. I kept my eyes fixed on the road ahead, blinking away errant teardrops. The ache in my heart was a familiar companion. Traffic crawled. The drive took longer than anticipated. We circled the block, hunting for a parking spot. Seconds ticked by and I cast anxious glances at my watch. Exasperated, Harold finally turned into a full lot, swung into an undesignated area and parked across the path of another car. He staggered ahead of me to the booth. Responding to the grunting noises, the parking attendant began to talk down to Harold, assuming he was a mentally challenged individual. I ran to help. The man asked why my friend was unable to speak. Harold was unperturbed by the patronising tone of the unwashed man. 
he handed the car keys over, gesturing to indicate that the vehicle could be moved if the necessity arose. I was incredulous. You leave the keys to an expensive car with a scruffy stranger? Harold shrugged. There was a dead look in his eyes. I resigned myself to a catastrophic day. We walked out of the parking lot together. I adjusted my pace to suit Harold's stumbling gait. I noticed how much weight he had lost in the past few weeks and how transparent his skin appeared. His clothes were several sizes too large for him. They hung on him like an old sack flung over a clothes horse. I resisted the temptation to grasp his arm to guide him over the uneven surface of the sidewalk, but my hand hovered casually beneath his elbow, just in case. A grim sense of foreboding took possession of me and formed a knot in the pit of my stomach. Directly ahead of us, up a short flight of steps, loomed the Federal Court of Canada to be continued.